All right. Welcome to another episode of Rebranding Cannabis. My guest today is none other than I would call the queen of cannabis, Jody Emery. <laughs> this is Rebranding Cannabis. I'm your host, Jared Mursky, and you're listening to the show that helps the industry grow. Hear from industry titans, thought leaders, and the up-and-coming founders of this multi-billion dollar industry. Presented by Wick and Mortar. Uh, Jody is best known for her activism in cannabis over the years. Um, she's been a huge supporter in both the legal format in Canada, but also in Washington and California. She's also a politician and uh, she single handedly, well, I should say at the time with her counterpart, um, built a, an empire of dispensaries. So Jody, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. And I've certainly done my fair share of political work. Um, being called a politician almost feels like an insult these days, but <laughs> it's not. <laughs> well, you know, Wikipedia doesn't lie. I'm just kidding. I have run for office five times at different levels of government. I've been very engaged politically for a long time um, because I think that's one of the three pillars of activism. You know, you need to get involved politically and help change the laws with the ones who do the lawmaking. You need to educate and inform people, and that includes media, podcasts, video, magazines. And you also need to engage in peaceful civil disobedience, uh, law-breaking, as it were. And I've certainly done all of those three different uh, approaches to cannabis law reform. And this April coming up, I'll celebrate 17 years of activism. And when I look at some heroes and leaders of the past, they've got decades under their belt. But uh, I certainly have seen a significant shift from what I would consider the earlier days of cannabis law reform activism to today, which is constantly bewildering in how many things are going on and changes are happening, good and bad. But overwhelmingly, we're on the winning side of history. And when I started out, we were not on the winning side, so it feels good yeah. to have gained a lot of ground, but I certainly I did do it with a lot of people, millions of people in Canada, the U.S., and worldwide. But you had to be a good leader in order to even, uh, you know, capture that many people as it relates to, you know, how you were able to, you know, really create this movement. So you've got to be pretty proud of yourself. I am proud. In some ways, it's funny because... Legalization in Canada is such a disaster in many ways. We can get into that. Um, but it's also very significant what we've done, you know. And I, part of me says, well, don't give me the blame for this legalization disaster. I'm, I don't want anything to do with that. But on the other side, the cultural shift, the, um, the overwhelming attitude shift and the direction we're going in does point to some victory. So I have mixed feelings when I see big corporate cannabis shops that are owned by police who arrested people for cannabis, and there are a lot of those. Uh, but at the same time, it makes me very proud to see mom and pop entre entrepreneurs opening their own stores, uh, not having to fear arrest anymore. And that was the whole point, is nobody should live in fear for their relationship with cannabis, for our lifestyle. Well, you sa and you sacrificed a lot to make other, li uh, other dreams come true for others. And it's, it's a crying shame that, uh, you know, here, you know, you were trying to essentially create the standard um, of what cannabis should be like in Canada. And it was, just it was just stolen from underneath you. And now you're completely unable to, to do what you did at the time you were doing it. And so that's got to feel like that's got to be a little bit of a blow to the chest, so to speak. Well, I'll fully confess the last Three years, um, I was arrested three years ago and charged and convicted. Um, it's been very difficult. And, you know, I had been through a lot of hardship before that. You know, my former husband, Mark Emery, he spent time in U.S. prison for financing mm -hmm. activism. And I went through a lot of hard times from 2000. Five years, right? Five percent. Yeah. And I yeah. got up close to personal. And so, um, but even through all those hard times, I always had an upbeat, positive attitude. Like nothing would phase me. Uh, I didn't even cry about things like for years and years. But once legaliza legalization uh, started happening, in Canada, 
and we saw uh, thousands of Canadians having uh, their dispensaries closed down. We saw harsh laws. Come, we saw a lot of injustice. In fact, a lot of prohibition type laws and regulations. And that was really hard. I, I admit seeing a lot of um, prohibitionists coming in and I don't mind them making money. Go ahead, make money, but don't arrest your competition. Like that's straight up cartel moves. And so I was really hardened. Um, I got quite bitter and jaded and I would just say it was straight up PTSD. It was years of personal hardship. But quite frankly, what I've always felt I've done is spoken not so much about myself, but about the people who need to be defended and spoken for. And that's what I get most is messages from people saying, thank you for speaking the truth. Thank you for saying what I want to say. Thank you for, mm -hmm. for us. And in that way, I did do a lot of leadership. And I felt that, you know, it was just mostly it was just me saying what needed to be said and what I knew millions of people were screaming to say in their hearts. And my responsibility was to make sure I was as articulate and professional as possible. And that's why I was invited to be official endorsers with initiatives in the U.S. That's why right. I've spoken to Parliament. That's why I've done so many quite prestigious uh, things that I'm very grateful and honored to have done. But once legalization started unfolding and it became this strange corporate government new prohibition or fake legalization, I would call it, um, it, it was very difficult and it felt very frustrating that we were trying to warn the public and the government about what they were doing wrong and what needed to be changed. And we were ignored and condemned and criticized and literally arrested, jailed, strip searched, convicted and robbed of everything we had. So I've, I've struggled with that for the last three years, but my medicine has always been cannabis uh, for many reasons. <laughs> and I discovered uh, microdosing psilocybin really was a lifesaver for me. I still do it. And growing my own cannabis, which if you follow me online, you saw I just had my homegrown harvest day the other day. <laughs> Here's a little tiny bud from an early branch I trimmed. Um, and it Save some for me. <laughs> be happy to share with friends and family. Well, you know, I'm actually not allowed to go into Canada right now. I've got criminal charges as well from cannabis myself. So I was... I used to be able to fly in there, and then when I went to drive into Vancouver, not that like maybe a couple of years ago with my buddy, um, they told me because of uh, previous weed charges that uh, when I back when I was like you know nineteen twenty years old, I'm thirty seven now, so um, now I'm now I have to go get uh, uh, it expunged, which sucks, but. Now that's that's what's been holding me back from going to Canada. But I was there all the time. I was, you know, I was consulting over there with like MNP and a lot of the, you know, Aurora and um, you know, some of my clients over there. It's it's been tough. The U.S. So you're like many <laughs> fellow advocates. And I, 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 we literally have friends and family, um, and we're kept apart by a border. And obviously, with this pandemic and COVID, there's other shutdown situations going on. But yeah. before that. Um, this was a major issue. This is something that we really need to address. And I worked with a group I founded called Cannabis Amnesty in Canada. And we've been working for full expungements. The government only offered pardons. Very pitiful. I mean, only 200 people or something were eligible and went for it. Um, but we've been asking for full amnesty. And part of my mission, which is a long-term mission of full liberation for our people and our planet. But right now, there's a lot of talk thankfully, in the United States, about recognizing the harm of the drug war, and particularly the racist origins and enforcement of it. And that's a problem in Canada, too. But you get a lot of talk from government about how it's such a tragedy and an, a great injustice, as our own minister said. Uh, but they still continue to criminalize cannabis and stigmatize it and lie about whether it's medicine or not. They say it's not. Right. And so we have all these issues. Uh, where Cannabis Amnesty is talking about the criminal records and the fact that we have victims of prohibition who are still suffering, who can't even work legally with cannabis mm -hmm. jobs, uh, and we need to fix that. And in the United States, Last Prisoner Project is doing great work too. And my Oh yeah, Steve's great. I love Steve. Yeah, my dream is to bring us all together. Like In each country and state and city, we have many levels of harms to repair. But on an international level, we need to start talking about the ability of victims of prohibition to be allowed to travel freely. You know, I can't think of many other lifestyle choices in North America where 
you can lose your children, lose your home, lose your job, either not getting hired or getting fired because of cannabis use. And we see endless harms beyond the straight up criminal justice system harms um, that are carried out because of the stigma. And that's something that's perpetuated worldwide. We know that if you go to any country where drugs are something you get executed for, uh, what symbol do they use? You know, they just legalized in Lebanon. Oh, well, that's amazing. And see, this is also what's really wild is the contrast. In some ways, we have rapid change happening in places like Thailand and elsewhere. <laughs> yet you have it's these crazy. These dark zones where uh, prohibition still persists. Mm-hmm. It feels like we're in the dying days of prohibition. You know, a dying vicious animal fights back hardest at the end, you know? And so the government Truth. doesn't want to let go, but they've already lost. We all know they've lost. We planted the seeds of freedom and we overgrew the government. Just like Mark Emery said, when he sold all those seeds around the world across the border for which he sold, served time. But I feel like a real revolution is taking place. And I think a lot of us feel that way. Again, we're on the winning side of history, which is great, but we can't be mm-hmm. complacent. And I think that's what was really disturbing about the last few years as we've seen legalization happen. There are those who would say, stop complaining, stop criticizing. It's finally changing. It's legal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've been told to shut up because it's legal. (laughs) My goodness. And then I have to remind them the only reason it's legal is because I didn't shut up in the first place. So, you know, it's like we (laughs) we have to point out the problems to fix it. You can't take a broken car and say, fix it if you don't say well it's the radiator or whatever like you need to actually get in there and so there's been a well if you don't start with those if you don't start with those small problems it can become a chain reaction of issues and and before you know it it becomes a lot harder to fix and and that's what we're seeing when you mentioned expungements i mean just getting it feels like it should be so easy to stop arresting people and erase all their records. How hard can it be to just do that? Well, and we're talking about ongoing systemic issues as it relates to this industry, uh, other industries as well. But this one has, you know, a, a, a larger issue at hand, and that's, you know, prison reform. Considering, yes, the mass uh, incarceration system. I mean, that's a gigantic driver, and that depends on the drug war, and it depends on uh, strict immigration policies, and it just depends on racism. Uh, we know that the new Jim Crow is just these prisons, the new system of mass slavery, the 13th Amendment allowing for slavery if you're been, you've been convicted of a crime. I mean, how how insane is that to think that, like even you, you could just be taken off, to, literally taken to a field and made to work as a slave just because you broke the law, um, a law that is uh, totally unjust. And it's one of those maddening things where you hear government saying they need to get rid of the criminal market. And it's like, well, it only exists because you criminalize it. So how about you stop criminalizing? Poof, it's gone. The criminal market's gone when you stop criminalizing. Well, or taxing the shit out of us. I was in California a couple of weeks ago and I bought three eighths. I spent over, <laughs> it was about $80 an eighth. And I was just like, holy shit. So bear in mind that the cannabis price is the pre-legalized, pre-legalization cannabis price was like 10 bucks a gram, let's just average. Why is it so expensive? Why isn't it like lettuce? Well, because there's risk involved with prohibition and the risk of jail. The risk goes up, the reward goes up. If there's no risk, there's no reward. It's just simple game. So when the government introduces these tough laws, they make it risky, they make it more valuable. And when the risk goes up, like in Canada, they increase the punishments. They uh, went from eight laws to uh, 45 laws. They really increased the law enforcement budgets. So what happens is when you make harsher laws, the good people, mom and pop, the peaceful hippies. And there's a certain point where you're like, I can't risk that. I got kids. I got, you know, I don't want to go to jail. But if you got a yep. gangster who knows that, hey, jail or not jail, that's my life, man. They don't care if the risk goes up because guess what? So does the reward. So government actually enriches organized crime by criminalizing it, making harsh laws. So when we're looking at cannabis and what it costs and the taxation they're putting onto it, well, first of all, let's remember prohibition began with like marijuana tax stamp act or whatever, right? Like it's a tax. Right, right. If you tax it to death, it's basically prohibition by another name. That's why I've used the hashtag new prohibition. Um, so over mm. overregulation is just a form of prohibition. If the price is prohibitive and accessing licenses is prohibitive, uh, prohibition, <laughs> I mean, it's just that's, the, that's what it is. So I also 
look back. You mentioned I did work on Washington and California. We talked a lot about. Thank you, by the way, because I live in Washington. So. And that was tough. And it was hilarious that, you know, one of the other endorsers was John McKay, former uh, district attorney for Western Washington, who mm -hmm. had my husband arrested and charged and jailed. But when we met to work together on ending prohibition, we even had a giant press conference in Canada. It was national. <laughs> hilarious people were like i don't get it you're sitting beside the man and i said he has nothing personal against mark or me he's doing his job a job yeah required by unjust laws so these laws are forcing good people to do bad things that change the law now if he was a dick about it while you guys were going through that then that might be another story right he was actually really surprised and uncomfortable like i didn't think to do it and i was like no i want to thank you and so that was the attitude i used to have and then I confess I got into a bit bitter, dark place because literally former cops. Tell me about that. Tell me more about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. that. Um, but I will just finish the note about Washington. Uh, the problem was we went as activists. We told government, you know, you need to legalize it because the industry is worth like $8 billion. That was up here in Canada. Sure. So you tell the government over and over again, it's worth a lot of money. We should legalize it. Well, what's the government going to do? They're going to say, it's worth how much now, did you say? Uh, how much? <laughs> awesome. And it's like, no, 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 we didn't mean it like that. <laughs> so that's a problem. But um, res with respect to access and all that, um, my activism career began in a weird way. Because if you go back to high school, um, I never drank. I never smoked weed. I never did any drugs. I was basically an anti-teenager at the age of 13. And I loved... Same. I loved um, authority. <laughs> I loved cops. I loved uniforms. I loved the idea of like telling people what to do for their own good. <laughs> Very bad way to live. That's obviously not good. But then my best friend started smoking weed. And I, and I was like, you guys are crazy. You may as well just... I said to them, you may as well just go kill yourself now because you're killing yourself with those drugs. And that was because I was parroting what I had been told by the authorities that I trusted. And I was watching as my friends, they watched something called Pot TV, which was the first video website on the internet, uh, started by Mark Emery back in 2000. It was before anyone even had a modem that could download video, mm -hmm. but still, uh, we had 20 years of that history. And they were reading Cannabis Culture Magazine. And that's the magazine Mark published as well that had the seed catalog for Emory Direct Seeds. Mm -hmm. And my friends that were smoking weed, I was giving them such a hard time, but they were reading these political articles and watching these political shows. And then 9-11 happened. 9-11 was interesting because I remember vividly that my friends were like, this is bigger than they're saying. This isn't about Afghanistan, this is Saudi Arabia, this is... Like they knew all about geopolitical warfare. They knew all about like incredible things that all tied into the war on terror, war on drugs, um, mass incarceration, industrial complex, all that. And I thought to myself, you know, this is weird. My stupid stoner friends are the smartest people I actually know. Like I'm, I have to admit, um, and they're watching this pot TV show and reading the magazine. So one night I decided to try beer for the first time didn't like it um and smoke <laughs> weed for the first time through a whole water bucket ice cream bucket with the top of a <laughs> <laughs> that was your first time smoking weed huh with the awesome playing trance music i downloaded on napster and a hot shower going napster my gosh um but this is when i first smoked weed and i remember i started to question authority and that's really the reason government wants to keep marijuana illegal is because they can't admit they were wrong about weed because what else are they wrong about then? And then the entire trust is dismantled. Not like it hasn't already been already. But government just wait till just wait till they just wait till aliens come down and everyone can see this now that everyone's got fun. That's when shit's going to get real shaken. Up. Everybody just say a Bob Lazar. Anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the whole like seeing that the weed people were actually smart and starting to question that. Uh, upended everything. And full disclosure, a year later, I thought, well, you know what? They lied about weed. They probably lied about cocaine too. And in grade 11, I tried cocaine and I developed a problem with it. And that was something that all my teachers and everybody were very concerned about because Jody was going to be a lawyer and then prime minister. And now she's doing drugs. And there was like this real concern. So I confessed to my parents. They sent me to a private school for grade 12. I went to boarding school where I discovered mushrooms and everything else. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, you are a hippie. 
I love it. But I did graduate with honors, and you're supposed to go to university in order to graduate. You have to get the uh, post-secondary uh, school, and I got accepted, but some bad stuff happened in my life, as does happen in people's lives, and I was able to get out of school without penalty and didn't know what to do with my life, and I was about to slip back into my very bad old habits when I decided to move to Vancouver, BC, from my hometown, Kamloops, BC, four hours away, mm-hmm. and I thought. I'm going to go there and uh, maybe work with Mark Emery and Cannabis Culture because we had been in touch online. He was always very accessible to anyone to educate them. So I moved here and he said, just follow me around, like watch how people interact and learn. And so I started going to rallies and, you know, really just took off from there. I became editor of Cannabis Culture magazine. I did. How old were you then? 2004, so 19, I moved here. 2004, so when I was 20, I became the editor. And then that was in 2005. And months later, the DEA came into Vancouver. Uh, Mark never went to the United States. Uh, Mark Emery, Direct Seeds, was a catalog in Cannabis Culture magazine. And Mark Mm -hmm. sells seeds to anyone, anywhere, and said, plant the seeds of freedom, overgrow the government, grow your own weed, and when you give me money, we're going to spend it to finance the movement. And he was the only person, even before George Soros, who would give money and it was millions of dollars to ballot initiatives, suing the government, medical marijuana in Colorado and many other states. Mark did yeah. all of that, marijuana marches worldwide. So the US government was like, this guy's a problem. <laughs> we gotta take him out because he's funding legalization. And the whole press release says he's just leading the legalization movement. So he was facing life in prison in 2005 that came to Vancouver which, by the way, was pretty offensive for most Canadians. It was like, wait, a foreign country can arrest a Canadian for breaking a law in a country they never went to? Like, why isn't Saudi Arabia coming and beheading people for women for driving or whatever, right? Like, how could another country come in and grab a Canadian who never went to America? So it was really twisted. It's called, it's all this history about deep integration. We're already well past that now with everything. But law enforcement was working together, and the thing was, the United States wanted to stop Mark. They named him the most wanted drug trafficker in Canada and one of the top. Oh, oh my gosh. It was wild to see that on the news. So if people want to go back to 2005, Mark Emery arrest, you can find some pretty wild. Is, is that how he became the Prince of Pot or was that before? Before, in 1994, he started selling seeds and doing marijuana in the newsletter, which was on hemp paper and it became cannabis culture and opened up head shops because it was illegal to sell pipes and bongs, but he said, I'm going to do it anyway. He was always breaking the law to challenge the law, including Sunday shopping, uh, importing rap music that was illegal uh, from Two Live Crew back in the uh, early 90s and 80s. <laughs> breaking the law in order to go to court to have the opportunity to challenge the law and get it changed, and he was very successful. That was the whole point. Um, but so when he... When he uh, started that, oh goodness, nobody else was doing any activism and uh, he really put himself on the line a lot. And I forget what the original question was, because <laughs> that's how it is when you're a weed smoker. But, uh, yep. yep. Well, you know what? Uh, we, uh, I always go off on tangents and into rabbit holes and that's the whole part of this anyways, is just to have an open conversation anyway, so no worries. Oh, the Prince of Pot. I was, we were talking about how, so how did he self-proclaim him, him how did he self-proclaim himself the, the Prince of Pot? Yeah. <laughs> that came up in an interview in 97, I think it was, and they wrote an article that was, said, uh, um, <laughs> Pot Prince winked at by police, something, something like that. And then, uh, uh, what was it, CNN came and did a story, and they did a segment where they called him the Pot Prince of Canada. And so then it got turned into Prince of Pot and he just ran with it. And that's what he's been called ever since. And then being his wife, I was called Princess of Pot, which I don't mind. I mean, whatever. <laughs> that girl doesn't want to be a princess. Well, a lot of girls don't want to be princesses, but that's aside from the point too. Um, but Mark got that title and was recognized worldwide because he ran for office. He financed political parties. Like Marijuana Policy Project was going to shut down in 97 or was it 2000? I can't remember the dates. But they came to him and he gave them thousands of dollars to stay afloat. He did that with Normal. He did that with many groups. Um, quite a pioneer um, and quite a controversial figure. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But everybody who changes the world is controversial if you want to get into it. So. That, that, that is true. That is very true. So, I mean, 
what uh, what are you working on now with Last Prisoner Project? Oh, well, I'm not directly involved right now because we're trying to find a way. It's actually 420. We were going to have um, 420 Vancouver is our massive rally held for it would be 26 years, if not for COVID. Uh, but we're mm-hmm. going to be doing a lot of cross promo and having Steve D'Angelo come up and speak, um, tying it into Cannabis Amnesty, which um, Seth Rogen is part of Cannabis Amnesty. But I know that he and many other celebrities are working with Last Prisoner Project. And all oh, right, back to the point of like, how did I get into this? And when I became um, an activist, and then, then I, you know, when Mark got arrested for seeds, obviously he didn't sell seeds anymore, and he never sold wheat right. because it's way too risky. So when he went. He got extradited in 2010. He served time in Seattle, Georgia, Mississippi. I went and visited a lot. Um, that was quite the eye opener, and it's why I'm super passionate about ending the drug war with respect to the mass incarceration and the harm of, of, of yep. the carceral state. But um, Mark, when he got extradited, I had to run a head shop, like selling bongs and magazines, you know, basic stuff. <laughs> and for office numerous times, I would speak at events in California, Washington, Boston, many places, um, Texas even. That was very cool. Um, but what, what I couldn't do was sell weed or seeds or anything. And, but we still led the movement, and I kept leading the way and doing a lot of work. And then when Mark got out of prison in summer 2014, I'd managed to keep our head shop and our cannabis lounge open. And it's one of the only lounges that's been around for, oh, how many years now? 14 years, we're almost up on. And, you know, he came back and we had seen in his absence a lot of progress, but a lot of dispensaries opened up, a lot of medical dispensaries, which were great. They were illegal or gray zone because there were a lot of court decisions favoring medical cannabis. Um, That's the only way we've changed the laws is through medical use first. So a lot of dispensaries opened up and we were facing competition just selling head shop stuff um, and we weren't selling weed. And it was like, well, mm-hmm. we're broke, we're struggling, we have uh, nothing going on. We had to shut down the magazine when he was extradited, we couldn't afford to print anymore. So I was the owner in 2009 and I remained the owner. So Mark was just showing up to like help out and right. expanded to a second location for a head shop and a lounge. But then suddenly an opportunity came up where I thought, you know, Mark really led the way and financed activism with selling seeds. He set the example. Why don't I set the example by selling weed? There's no adult use stores. There's only medical dispensaries, which is good. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, you either have to be sick or you have to lie about being sick to access medicine through a dispensary. And everybody knows that's not fair, that it's kind of almost discrediting true medical marijuana than people who want recreational weed have to go mm-hmm. to the doctor to get a prescription. So I thought legalization is coming. We've changed the laws. I was running for the Liberal Party that put forward legalization. I mean, I was really in- involved. And I thought someone needs to open stores and set the example of what adult use is. Anybody can come in and get weed for whatever reason. If you're sick, that's your business. But like, we want to provide access to medicine and create a model where entrepreneurs across Canada can own their own business and be buoyed by the, the brand recognition and the history that we can bring. So we had no money, and I thought, but well, we've got a brand here, Cannabis Culture. It's a great brand. It's a very recognized. And, and I thought, why don't we offer this idea of opening up stores um, where the official reports in my sentencing says we got a lot of money from buy-ins, but the truth is all the stores, we waived the buy-in fee because we were like, we don't know if we can sell marijuana or not. Like, don't want to, but let's just see how it goes. And so within like one or two months, we were opening up dozens of stores. I had over 300 requests. We managed to get 30 locations. And the most exciting thing is that I would open it and it was my model and my vision. And I would say, we're here breaking the law openly and publicly to set an example of what legalization should look like. Adults using cannabis responsibly with their privacy protected in a store that's owned by a local, employing locals and selling local products. That's the vision. That's the dream. It's taking the best of the medical dispensary and creating what everyone else should get too. And of course, at that time, we had a bunch of former politicians and cops and you know drug squad officers with mm-hmm. their own weed companies and going to the stock market to raise money to pay for the insane prohibitive costs of. Mm-hmm. Since- so they were like, uh-oh, this isn't good news. And we know, and I have examples of lobbying done to shut down all the dispensaries. So 
This was actually happening right before we opened. There was a massive series of raids in Canada called Project Claudia. By major coincidence, happens the day we were opening our first Toronto cannabis culture store. Um, and it was such a crazy day, but it was a massive series of raids and it was highly criticized because everyone said legalization is coming. Why the hell is the government spending millions of dollars shutting down the thing that's not supposed to be shut down anymore? And so it was unfortunately a power grab and government and corporations just wanted, to, and they said straight up, we're going to shut down your mm-hmm. locations and take over and open them ourselves with the help of our handy government gunmen called the police. And so I was on a national broadcast at the police station. It was live across Canada on May 26, 2016. And all the media and everyone were like saying to the police, why would you do this? And I managed to get in there. I don't know how, but I did. And I was there and I was asking questions and the police chief got real mad. And then it turned into a debate and I accidentally took over. And every national network was broadcasting this. And I made a little speech, which you can find if you Google uh, Jody Emery saying, Justin Trudeau lied or the liberals lied. This is not legalization. So it's like a short little rant on a very hot day where I basically said, everything summarized in a short soundbite um and that was the what was it what was it? what'd you say exactly because they said there were complaints against dispensary that's why they had to shut them down and i was like if there were 15 complaints there are fifty thousand patients today who don't have access and this is nothing but former cops and politicians seeking to take over an industry and i just i just spoke the truth and then i said i was like who's complaining who called for this to happen nobody except the government and then i said uh the Toronto police are the biggest gang with guns around. That was like, ugh. <laughs> that was my sentencing because oh, man. that day, um, the Project Gator began. Project Gator was a special project investigating me, Mark Emery, and our team from the Cannabis Culture Crew, which culminated in my arrest in March 2017. Um, Project Gator. Now, how how did it come, how did that name come to be? Do you even know? They never tell how their names come to be. But <laughs> I think it, it might be because they might have been like alongside us the whole. It was quite <laughs> frankly hilarious because the whole disclosure for my case was like, here she is tweeting that she's breaking the law. Here she is admitting how they're doing the law breaking. And even the day we were arrested, Mark and I were about to fly to Spanibus and obviously not taking weed or money. I never even sold weed. I just oversaw the whole conspiracy. Um, but right. so we got arrested and the, when we had left the apartment, I had every financial report for the whole company printed and stapled and stacked. And I was like, I don't want to read this on the plane. I'm going to leave it here. So when they raided the apartment, the cops come in like a whole set of printers. Like, it was just the funniest series of things. And the only other evidence they got was all of our records of paying our taxes because we always pay taxes. <laughs> I like, I like how they can illegalize something, but you're re- you're required to pay taxes on it well that's what's so funny is like we're paying for our own oppression um it's not funny it's actually terrible but it also argues the point that ironically funny yeah and it just makes it clear that a lot of money is being wasted on law enforcement and like we can talk about how much the weed industry is worth but let's talk about how much is spent on enforcement and unfortunately in canada before legalization it was about 500 million a year that they admitted to Mm-hmm. Now um, it's up to a billion when you add up all wow. state and city budgets, like 70 million here, 200 million there to go after illegal growers. And basically everything that was illegal before remained illegal. The government only legalized the ability for corporations to sell pot. So you, you couldn't sell pot that was already, that you already knew how to grow. You had to get a new building, a new license, a new facility, sell it through their avenues. And Canada is way worse than the U.S. with respect to packaging, branding. We have government middle. Oh, oh yeah, so bad. I mean, I mean, I was I was down there um, helping LPs understand how to navigate uh, the Canadian Cannabis Act or bill uh, from a packaging and branding perspective. You know, it's like um, you know you're not allowed to build a lifestyle brand, um, and and you're limited to colors, and there's so many. So many rules and regulations. I mean, you, you, like, I'm probably one of Seth Rogen's biggest fans. In fact, uh, and, and the reason why I bring him up, you mentioned him earlier, um, and you know his his brand Houseplant is, uh, you know, really cool. Um, and and but you look at like all of the packaging that they use, and you look at all of the packaging a lot of these other brands have to use, and there's just so much waste. 
happening because there's um, so many different layers of packaging that are needed in this market, and it and it creates so much waste. You know, when I when I got asked to help um, modify uh, both the OLCB and the L by the LCB and OLCB to help modify their packaging regulations. You know, one of the things that I've been, you know, really pushing and lobbying for is removing child resistance from flour. Because if a child is old enough to know how to smoke weed, they're old enough to know how to open up child resistant packaging. So I don't get the point of wasting so much extra plastics and material on that. And bear in mind that child proof is also disabled proof medical patient group in many cases trying to open these containers is really really difficult for people who need access to medicine and the packaging the reason they have to put one little joint in a giant box is because the government requires a label that says marijuana is addictive in one out of two people bullshit claim no science so the government has all these claims that are perpetuating stigma which allows employers to continue firing people and parents to continue losing their kids because the government says right on the package it's dangerous for you and then i actually flip that around and i go well maybe that's the government being honest because that government beat is pretty shitty maybe it is dangerous for you maybe you shouldn't smoke it <laughs> labels are true go back to your guy because he doesn't have warning labels because it's good but with respect to packaging and all of that the branding you said a word there lifestyle now in canada under the cannabis act you're not allowed to mention or promote cannabis in a way that associates it with a lifestyle including glamour daring vitality excitement basically defining who i am glamorous and daring and vital and exciting it's like cannabis is my lifestyle like for yoga people yoga is their lifestyle for vegans for music concert goers for motorcycle enthusiasts whatever you're into coffee craft well, they're trying to keep it medical, but we're trying to keep it, we're trying to keep it real. And, and, you know, so, you know, just a couple of the things that I usually tell, tell brands to be mindful of is, uh, you know, especially when cannabis initially became legal in Canada, a lot of people were leaning towards celebrity endorsements, but, but, but moved away from those in fear of, um, uh, breaking the rules and regulations. But what they failed to realize is that, you can still, uh, you know, have a celebrity as a brand ambassador and put out content and commercials as long as it's um, a positive reflection of how to avoid making mistakes or breaking the law. Like, you know, don't fly, you know, like if Snoop Dogg, you know, came on and I mean, he may not be the best example because he totally smokes weed and drives, I'm sure. But if he said, you know, don't smoke weed and drive, you know, a message by Snoop Dogg sponsored by, you know, Canopy or Aurora, whomever, you know, um, cannabis culture, right? That would clearly be uh, a non-violation, but rather a loophole. Um, and then there's other things too, like you know, I think there's a lot of there's a lot that is to be said about the company culture of a company, right? So if, for example, I created a VR tour or a video that just shared the stories and experiences as it relates to the people that work for me or work for you, you're not actually emoting or promoting a lifestyle. You're just talking about how happy your team is and rather just conveying and displaying how strong comp the company culture is. And so that can oftentimes lead to um, what one might assume or a consumer might assume as the, the lifestyle of the brand because these are the people that are living it. So that's the lifestyle that they live. And that's kind of my loophole method. So it's also a logo and product. It is absolutely a feeling. So yeah, when you think of these brands, like I think of House Plant, I think of their brand, which they've effectively done, got retro VHS style. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Feel it, and, like my Jody's Joint brand has things. And, you know, like we all have, we have our own feeling with the company, but also with the rules and regulations. Like in many cases, we do need to find loopholes and work around it. True. Um, like that's how I have. I can't. You're the loophole master, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> well, I gotta find them somehow because like. Other, you're left out otherwise. So my, but my concern is that I still need to challenge these laws. And thankfully, even though there are hard, there are harsher punishments and penalties that do exist, but there is more acceptance and there are more opportunities for change. So with the Cannabis Act regulations, like here's a tragedy. High schools used to get newspapers delivered because students read newspapers. Yep. In Canada, 
the high schools all had to write the government because newspaper companies won't send newspapers to schools anymore because they run advertisements from cannabis companies which aren't allowed to be seen by those under 19. So if a news mm. gets in a school, so all of a sudden these teachers are like, wait, our kids can't read news articles in a paper because of a stupid Cannabis Act law that prohibits any, like, and those age gates on websites, you're, all you're doing is deterring people from educating themselves, teaching young people how to lie about their age. You're not actually preventing any harm. We should be providing information, not hiding it and making it mysterious. But again, that's perpetuating the stigma so government can continue to criminalize it so they don't have to admit that they were wrong because... You know, it's just such a, I, I kind of pity the government. On the one hand, they're like, it should be legal. We were wrong. It's a racist, horrible injustice. And on the other side, they're like, but of course, we got to still spend money in cops. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like this bizarre situation. But I, for us, um, I plan to challenge the Cannabis Act restrictions on promotion. I mean, our magazine website doesn't have an age gate. Um, we actually got a letter from Health Canada for running an ad for our head shop in a newspaper in 2018. So, the enforcement arm is out there, but the good thing is you can challenge these without too much risk. Like a fine is a lot less punitive, and that's what I got. That's why I'm not in jail. I got an insane fine. Um, and probation. And, it was like, and probation, and I finally, finally just crawled out from all under that. So now I'm like at ground zero, and I'm launching all these new exciting projects. And so on that note, you actually asked me about an hour ago. Um, what are, what are yeah, what are your new projects? Yeah, but I'm glad we got to start from the beginning because that's, I think, I think it's it's good to start there because for those that are going to be listening to this, um, who have never read about you or have heard about you before, um, it's good for them to know, you know, why you're on this show and why you are in fact helping rebrand cannabis, not just the flower, but the industry, and that's what the show is all about. And some. Something interesting, I should point out, is again, in the last three years, it was pretty uh, distressing because a lot of newcomers were coming into cannabis. And mm -hmm. they, quite frankly, a lot of them were looking down their nose at our movement and being like, oh, a bunch of dirty criminal hippies. They don't know how to run a business. And meanwhile, these sophisticated decades old cannabis businesses are like, say what? <laughs> um, hello, do you want to come see that we know how to? That was the mystery of Humboldt. You know, these were all college educated people coming from you know, uh, areas of California looking for a better life and in the woods and, you know, wanted to kind of live in their own, um, you know, utopia. So and even an underground utopia. So on the one hand, mm -hmm. it's, it's unfortunate that this beautiful cannabis culture that has existed, not the brand, the culture of cannabis, the community. Right. We've been underground all around the world by necessity, which is a terrible mental health thing too. We should talk about the stigma and shame of having to hide your use of cannabis, like that has a lot of impact on people's psyche. It's really harmful. Um, and so if we're talking about mental illness and getting rid of stigma, cannabis reform in messaging has to be part of that picture. Um, but of course, I went off track on a tangent again, just seconds ago, we were saying. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's the recent projects that you're working on. And so, well, a lot of um, the activism work, the, the culture of cannabis everywhere, we've been underground. And so as it's emerging, there's a lot of who don't know anything at all about weed except what the government has told them. So there's a lot of stigma and discrimination. So a lot of newcomers to cannabis were really um, ignorant and arrogant, quite frankly. And that was upsetting because I knew that we had such a beautiful culture of knowledge that needed to be celebrated and raised up. But yeah, a lot of people had to go underground and, and hide. So when, when you have, for that period of time, I was really bitter towards the newcomers and like, you don't know anything about weed. You don't mm -hmm. know about Jack Ferrer. You don't know about this or that, <laughs> which is like, I get it. it. Every old fucking activist of any type has that little bit. I know. I interviewed Ed Rosenthal um, on a previous podcast. Man, that guy, he loves your husband or your ex-husband rather. He quotes things like overthrow the government. Like that's his... Like if there was another person to quote that, it would be him. Um, and then I had Dan Herrer on a podcast uh, uh, previously too. And he, man, I love him. He's a good friend of mine. He's great. We have a lot of grievances and it's fair because we've been totally fucked over and screwed over and uh, mi mistreated and abused. And, and it's just such a horrible, massive injustice. In 30 years, they're going to look at cannabis prohibition like we look at slavery. Like it's going to be, in fact, I, you could argue that, like I said, new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander coined that, um, read her book. 
Um, she, the new Jim Crow, we're seeing this this horrible crisis. And like you said, it's just the war on cannabis and the war on drugs and mass incarceration and racism are all tied in together. And so we're seeing some major shifts and positive changes. And on that front, I, I'm trying to change my attitude. You know, I used to look at the newcomers like, oh, you don't know how hard we had to work. You don't know how much people have suffered. You don't know all the patients who died while we tried to be liberated. And then there's a little bit of that. But I'm also coming at it like, who was I when I was a new, when I didn't know the difference between CBD and THC? In fact, nobody even talked about that then. You know, but like, when I was new, was I met with a welcoming educational introduction? Or were you yep. told, oh, you don't know anything. So I thought, oh man, this is and so part of my healing in the last year. Because again, just a three year period of trauma and hate and pain and awfulness. Otherwise, yeah. I've been really positive. This is me, positive. But I, well, I love it. You're great. <laughs> I have to be more embraced. I don't know. Like, it, it's almost exciting to see how many, you know, you see people talking on the street about learning about CBD and it's these old grannies that are helping each other out. Like, there's a massive... Yeah. Um, quiet revolution happening underneath the exciting corporate glamour of brand and cannabis revolution that's happening. And it's a, it's a revolution of people returning to their health, to self uh, care, to like individualized care, um, controlling what we eat and what we do. I think even with respect to coffee, beer, food, in every market, we're seeing a desire to return to local, um, you know, like really helping communities, small, sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mass production, uh, you know, like food farms or all these, you know, the, the horrible wastelands of animals. We're factory farms, basically. Factory farms for food and animals and everything else are going out of style. Um, although they're probably more affordable. Yeah, Ed always likes to talk about the, the tomato model. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you go to the cannabis was always the opposite of mass production factory farm. And unfortunately, a lot of the new big corporations literally built prisons with barbed wire, cameras, concrete walls to imprison cannabis and grow it like a factory farm. And that weed didn't turn out. And those companies are failing for it because cannabis has to be grown by people who care about it and love it. It's, it is small batch by nature, even if small batch is a giant deal. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It, I'm excited to see that. And on that front, uh, I did grow myself uh, the second year and I found it extremely therapeutic. I want more people to grow cannabis desperately. Uh, Mark's slogan, plant the seeds of freedom to overgrow the government, like with plants, a revolution of plants, not violence. Um, that To get more people growing their own would be magical. I look at an apartment building out my window and I'm like, there's got to be at least 200 people in there who could grow, do a grow tent. And even if the building regulations don't allow it, you know, and that is the case for most people, it's not really legal for most if you don't. Right. Um, who hasn't been breaking the law about cannabis before, right? Like, so. <laughs> well, you, you know, when I started, Jody, you know, I started 12 years ago uh, and I was a grower. I mean, I, I should say I was a grower's helper. <laughs> I, I, I um, well, so like about 14, 15 years ago, I had grown a couple of basement grows with my friends. And um, I was like, ooh, there's some money in this. But growing wasn't like really something that I enjoyed doing. I was I was always a designer, right? And so I had already had my other agency, Mersky Media, at the time, and I went into a dispensary, and I was like, "Oh my God, they all look the same, and it looks like a, I mean, this looks like the, this an underground shag shop, right? It's just it does it looks terrible, you know." And I'm like, "There's there's a there's a need here for some uh, rebranding, some uplifting." And so 12 years ago, I was like, "You know what? I'm going to start a cannabis focused branding and marketing firm," and start shaping the way cannabis brands and businesses should start approaching the market. And that was why I got started. So it's, it's really cool to see how you got started. There's a lot of similarities there. And you have diversity of cannabis, because that's another thing that happened is a lot of the new companies might have been too slick, like they want to be the Apple store of weed. How many times have you heard that? But then we have to remember there's all sorts of different brands and, and feelings that different people want, whether you're a video game nerd, go to high school, or if you're like me and you like hemp and nice design you could go to jody's joints when i open them up again and it's like so you have these brands that can cater to a certain segment of the population without necessarily looking down on any of the other ones and it's like that diversity represents what cannabis is it's like everybody uses weed 
you're so right. You, t you talked about, Jody, you just said something so cool. And I'm so glad you said this because this is a conversation not enough people are having uh, with themselves as well as with others as it relates to how to build a brand in the cannabis industry. There's too many companies trying to be everything to everyone with one brand and every product under the sun to kind of rule them all. And, and that's not how the CPG world works anywhere. And it's, it's all about your, the point you're making is, is really differentiation in the market and understanding all of these countercultures and subcultures that exist that are consumers. So I love to use the example, and you started the conversation with gamers, right? When you look at, when you look at strain specificity, you'll notice that people in the market today don't know what the hell Blue Dream is or Granddaddy Purple is, or is it an indica sativa hybrid? Or indica sativa is even a thing anymore. Everything's a hybrid now. And, and is, is indica dominant and sativa dominant real? No, it's not. It's all based on one's perception of how they feel, but how much dosage, like how much am I taking? And so who's the judge of that? But what it's boiling down to is now communication, right? And how can we communicate to consumers in the simplest format what the intention or experience that they will get from this you know, strain. So I did a, I posted a video on my YouTube, um, why the strain game is lame. Um, the title's a little lame too, but it's, it's kind of catchy. But uh, it's because I believe, and I'll get kind of back to the gaming thing, but I believe that uh, moving forward, uh, we need to start developing a, a, a packaging language that communicates to consumers what the effect is versus something that they then have to go look up on Google or Leafly or Weed Maps or whatever the case is. So when I look at a brand that, let's say, is focused on a video game demographic, now I don't know if you know this, but video game players, um, av the average video game player ranges between 35 and 40 years old, and they make about $80,000 a year. So that's a huge demographic. I am a video game player now. I play UFC 4 all the time. And I love it. And I smoke weed all the time while I'm playing it. So I'm exactly that demographic. But there's even more people like that. And so if you were to create packaging and the language were to be like play, pause, um, reset, you know, as the different experiences as they relate to the strains that you've chosen or the series of strains that you've chosen, it makes it easier to communicate, to your point, the culture that you're focused on because you're speaking their language not your own language that you're expecting everyone else to understand. Yeah, so it's like you're a gamer and you smoke weed, you know what kind of weed gamers want to smoke. Like it's that simple. It's like it's going to be maybe different from a yoga enthusiast. You know, they might actually have something they prefer too. But what I love about all this uh, diversity in the brands and in the offerings is like, it's like the entourage effect. It's like cannabis. You can't just have one. You got to have them all. <laughs> you know, you gotta That's right. That's right. You know, and you know, if you can gamify the way people can purchase cannabis and you can, but see, everyone just thinks though, oh, I'm going to make my packaging look pretty and it's going to sell itself. But that's not the case when everyone is starting to look and sound the same, same story from an origin perspective, all the same stuff. You get, it, everything gets lost in the smoke and we have the federal government controls all the production of weed. So in order to grow it, sell it, you got to get a federal license from Health Canada. And then when you grow your weed, you can sell it to a different province if you have a deal with that province like the state. So the provincial government has to be like, oh, Canopy, we want your weed. And then you over there, Aurora, we want yours. Very political then, huh? Yeah. And then they sell the same stuff to all the stores. So basically when you go to a cannabis store, it's the same companies, the same products, the same brands, the same items. The only difference is the decor and the style and the way they display. So like we've, we've been lacking the diversity in the actual product where people are selling it, like coming up with great branding and design. But now I think what they want is to set themselves apart with select products. Like if you How do you think the government can fix that? What do you think the approach for them should be? There's a lot of work to be done done um i ideally i think provincial governments should be allowed to uh, license growers themselves right now with health canada and the federal government controlling it it's a total bottleneck like and when you have a big province like ontario and they want to open thousands of stores apparently but they can't open them quickly because there's not enough weed to get into the stores and the weed that is available is really shitty so the ontario government i think and every provincial government should turn to the feds and say Listen, like 
you aren't licensing craft growers enough. You're not licensing enough of existing market that's already selling weed on the black market. Like get them a fucking license. They're already growing and selling. Like get them licensed. But Health Canada doesn't want to because they're if you restrict supply, you get the you know so the provincial governments are like basically being forced by the federal government to not be able to provide what they need to, to yeah. the city and the stores. So if the provincial government like my idea of British Columbia, good B C bud, not Beasters, not the bad B C bud. The real Mm-hmm. But the beautiful exit, you know, the stuff I'm smoking to be quite honest. BC Bud has BC Bud has gotten lost in translation, mind you. It was the thing we always heard about, and then and then we were like, oh wait, what's this Humboldt shit? Um, and then it was like, mm, what's better? And you know, it's like still out there. It's great. We have a lot of great growers. They just can't get licensed because the prohibitive costs and uh, uh, police checks. Like you all have to go through everything. It's like the most invasive. You can buy a gun and open a bar way easier than selling weed. It's just terrible. So with provincial governments, I think the BC government should basically say, hey, feds, you are way too busy with COVID and all this other shit. Like you're, you don't need to spend time processing licenses. We're going to process licenses. And I say this because in Canada, we have a unique situation where every product has to be able to move in Canada from coast to coast. Like you can sell this in BC and Alberta and Ontario and anywhere. That's the law. The government cannot say, hey, you can't sell those BC made lighters in Alberta. They're not allowed to do that under our constitution. But alcohol, unfortunately, during alcohol prohibition, got a loophole where the provincial governments were like, we're going to control all the sale and movement and good retail, wholesale, all the alcohol is our domain. So we have this multi-decade long provincial alcohol control. So when cannabis got legalized, it got sucked into alcohol. Mm-hmm. The Supreme Court of Canada, Cannabis Culture and myself went to the Supreme Court of Canada. We were accepted as interveners in a big case to try and break down the provincial alcohol borders so you can sell BC wine to Ontario. Well, you should be able to. It's Canadian. but Right. That's weird to me. It's like it's one country. But I mean, it's really the same here in the U.S., though, as it relates to states. So I guess it's, it's weird, though, because Canada is so different. We are most of most free. But-, but you guys are federally legal now, and theoretically. But are you? Eh, this is the thing. What does legal mean anyway, actually? Right? <laughs> right. For, to me, legalization originally meant stop criminalizing the culture, the growers, the community, the stores. Stop arresting and criminalizing Canadians and harming their lives. And stop wasting billions of dollars on law enforcement. That's simple. One, two, three. None of that's been accomplished. Everything that was illegal before is still illegal now. Criminal records and arrests continue every day. And there's more money on law enforcement. So that's why I called it fake legalization. That was the hashtag for a long time. But I'm being optimistic because there are major changes. And I'm seeing weed stores opening up everywhere. And like, there's here's a phrase that has changed my life quite a lot in the last year. The glass is half full and half empty. It's both. And, and for a long time, I was looking at just the half empty side. All the loss, all the harm. The people who write me begging for help because their kids are being taken because they use medical marijuana. People losing their jobs after 30 years because of drug tests because the laws now require drug tests. Those people wrote me and there's a lot of bad going on, like a lot of it. But there's a lot of good too. And we need to celebrate the good and praise the good and encourage the good. You have to encourage the good growth. So in Canada, we still have a lot of issues. And that's why I'm trying to lobby that provincial governments will say, hey, listen, we have this because we lost at the Supreme Court. Basically, the alcohol right. monopolies remain. Province, the governments control booze because it's their biggest source of revenue. So the right. provincial governments are like, you know what? We're going to, this is my dream. They say, since we already control the production, wholesale, and retail control of alcohol, the same bureaucrats control cannabis. So how about we're just going to license and wholesale and retail our own cannabis. Don't worry, feds. We got ourselves covered. We got enough growers. We're going to get them licensed. We're going to get a lot of weed made. You don't need to license them. We're doing it. That's my dream. That's something I'm going to lobby on. There's a lot of groups working on like farm gates so that you can grow weed on your field and invite people to come and buy it there. Right now you can. Mm-hmm. So there's, a, there, there's actually a ton of issues and I'm going to launch, speaking of my projects, it's not done yet. And it's one of those side projects for my business and emergencies take up most of my time because I run about 10 businesses. And so then I have only <laughs> a little bit left for the rest of it. But I have a group I'm launching called Fair Cannabis. And the idea is FAIR stands for uh, Fair and Inclusive Regulations. 
because it's an organization that's supposed to be an umbrella group that basically says, what are you interested in? Taxation, hemp, medical marijuana, employment laws, housing issues, medical issues. Like, what's your issue? Click it. Here's a page. Here's a court case on that issue. Here's a human rights tribunal case you could join. Here's a, a, a company that's doing that thing. So is this a, is this a forum board? Uh, is this like in conjunction with like edu a, a platform of just like education that's out there that they don't have to find themselves? Like, it's basically a way to like say to people, hey, you care about cannabis and you want to make a difference. Obviously, there's normal and MPP and there are groups out there. But it's like if you, want, if you have a specific interest, how do you find people who are working on reforming the employment drug testing laws? Like that's a niche thing. But so fair cannabis would be like, oh, what's that page? And the page would say, well, here are some people that are working on it. Like here's, um, you know, cannabis amnesty would be if you care about criminal records. Uh, the BC Craft Cannabis Co-op would be if you care about craft cannabis life. Have you considered though, like I, I think one of the things that y you could be doing too to further this in a faster way would be to not just look at who's already in the industry with uh, uh, the need and want to do this, but look outside the industry to people who perhaps have more power, but don't understand what you're doing or what you're fighting for, thus perhaps giving you some additional uh, horsepower, if you will, from you know outside perhaps policymakers or friends of those that are. Uh, so just a, just a thought, because LinkedIn has been a great platform for me to introduce my area of expertise to people who have pondered the thought of what it would be like to be in the industry or how they might apply their skill set to the industry and and so i'm i'm you know i'm open i'm like hey let's let's talk about it because there's there's a wealth of opportunity and they have their knowledge and skill set to bring which only makes us stronger so it's like bringing in more right. people who don't know so that's something like i i could be accused of being um quite critical of big corporations that lobbied to have dispensaries closed down so they could make money i have reason to criticize them but even canopy growth which is was my arch nemesis but i think you know <laughs> again i'm getting over these hard feelings um they did a lot of very bad things and i've documented all of it but they also financed national expungement week you know being that's being hosted to help erase people's records they are working on studies to prove that cannabis is medicine and helps with the opioid crisis. So like they're doing a lot of the work that I find important and want to be done. Um, so I can't really criticize. Have you thought about, have you thought about just like saying, you know what? I recognize that with big corporations, not every person can be a good apple. Um, but I, but I, but I would love to help you further this and think about this, Jody, they have the money and the resources to give you a uh, platform beyond the one you've already developed for yourself to really go out there and make true, true change. And that's why I'm coming at this new year, being 2021, because 2020 is coming. But 2021 is like the year of reconciliation, you know, in many, mm -hmm. on all fronts in society. I think we need a lot of that. Um, so I want to... Would you say that's a bit of an ego check or that's just like a... Or you're doing like a... Uh, an analysis on how you've handled certain situations in the past so that you can go, you know what, how can I take that negative or positive and apply that to my future and learn from that? I'm looking at how I used to be, you know, when Mark was extradited and his prosecutor, you know, I didn't get mad at him. I, I worked with him to make it better. I took, I took something, I took the lemon and turned it into lemonade to fill the glass half full. So, you know, it's like, I, I right. Yep. Due to working together, even despite our differences, um, that's always how I used to be. The last three years or so, I was in a really dark, tra traumatized place, um, and I'm emerging from that, and I'm and I'm returning to who I was, and so that's why suddenly a lot of wonderful things are happening. Um, for those who don't know, I opened a place called Jody's Joints because I'm Jody and I roll joints. I roll a lot of them, and <laughs> the idea of legalization looking a bit like Amsterdam, you know, like to me, the idea of getting a beautiful latte in a nice little cafe with a nice bag of weed and you sit and roll it up. Like that's civilized, socially accepted normalization. I want normalization. So I had this dream of opening up lounges in Canada, which are illegal, but working on that. Um, and I opened up a coffee shop in Kensington Market, Toronto. And a big, a big part of my activism history is actually being an environmentalist. I've run for the Green Party 
eventually. And as a kid, I just, I've always been a nature girl um, and a city girl, but also a nature girl. And I love <laughs> hemp. I think hemp is amazing. But most of my work was on civil liberties and criminal justice. So mm-hmm. hemp is a little side project I wanted to get into. So I built this beautiful coffee shop with hemp wallpaper, hemp oil stained counters, wood counters, all they were beautiful, and uh, hemp uh, cushions made of fabric, hemp soap, hemp milk lattes, hemp baked goods. It was really awesome. And it was an example of what, um, you know, we didn't sell weed, but we were hoping to get a license. I was on probation at that time. And so it was just strictly a coffee shop. But I got even little mugs made and all sorts. Your tagline, your tagline should be, she should be like, hemp, hemp, hooray. And I was so full of hemp, hemp, hooray. Like, you can tell I get enthusiastic. Well, I'm very enthusiastic right now. And about... I'm glad. That's good. So what I was doing was um, showing that hemp is so versatile and wonderful, but also trying to set it down. So that's something I hope to revive. Cannabis culture hopes to uh, come back with licensed stores very soon. We're working on it. So I will uh, have announcements on that front. We're working on getting... Cool. The- so quite a few different projects going on right now. Although I seem to be getting a lot of calls from my team. I don't know why, but it can't be too much of an emergency. Well, one thing that I wanted to kind of circle back on that, I, and I just wanted you to let you know, let you kind of finish your thought. Um, but one thing I wanted to circle back on was you had mentioned um, earlier how people were coming to you for help. And one of the groups you had mentioned was were women um, having their children taking, taken away from them um, because they're what, cannabis consumers, they're, they're in the industry, or can you expand a little bit on that? That was an interesting thing to me. Something that a lot of people didn't know about in the U.S. and drug calls, like the, typically like a guy would be dealing, um, but they go and they arrest the girl, they try and tie the girlfriends in and get the women pulled into these conspiracy charges. And because the women aren't actually involved, they're just the girlfriend or the wife, but or the mom or a daughter, like they get pulled into it and then they get put in prison for being part of a conspiracy that they didn't have to do with. And there was a lot of that, but what, what really messed me up a lot was see when I went to the US, like I at first I didn't have my driver's license and Mark was sent to different places and I would have to like arrange rides with people. And when he was in Yazoo City, Mississippi, um, I would arrange, you know, I fly into it was Jackson, Mississippi, Jacksonville, Mississippi. And then it's an hour long drive to Yazoo City. So it was like, okay, if there's another family Damn. visiting, they can drive me and I'll pay for their home. Mm-hmm. So I would got to know like this family with the dad in their jail and his three kids and they're all from Louisiana. And you know, like you see the pain and the trauma and, and, and when you're in the visiting room, um, like some of the mothers tell the kids that dad is just at work. Like they just think this is a factory and he's just at work. Because uh, having, like when you're a kid and you're in school, they tell you police officer good, prisoner bad. And so like if you're a kid there in school and you're constantly told that your dad is bad or even your mom or whoever is bad because they're in prison, it's like that's terrible for them. So a lot of the moms are trying to protect their kids. The worst part was like you see all these families coming in and get like, hours together and then when you leave like the men have to line up on the one wall they're all getting strip searched as they leave one by one and all the families have to stand up on the other wall they only take out five people at a time and so it takes like about an hour to get out just like standing apart watching from afar and you see like the kids go little kids go running and running and running to daddy and running into his arms and then we're running back to mom and i remember this one yeah. i was sitting and one kid did that and came back and the mom of the child and the grandmother, the mother of the prisoner, um, had their backs turned to him, um, like many of them would, because they, they couldn't bear to see them because they were crying and they didn't want them to see them crying. And the kid would, it was just so messed up. And I remember that was like the only time I cried in prison. Uh, like I got through it, I was strong, I had support, like I was okay. But to see these families and then it's like to see them go through so much pain and the cost of traveling and getting patted down when you visit it takes hours and it's just it's a horrible experience but it's like those are the lucky ones like other other prisoners families can't visit and can't even afford phone yeah. calls so it's like how tragic that this mass incarceration system doesn't just hurt the people that are locked up it doesn't just hurt the prison guards who don't want to be there but that's the only job in the whole city it hurts 
like generations. It creates this generational trauma. And you've seen that. That's like it's it's already happened with First Nations people and African Americans and a lot of communities and cultures have like just endured endless generational trauma and pain and the prison system contributes so much to that. And I, I remember a woman that was here, Natalie, she's a black woman who lived in Vancouver and it was a long time ago. And um, we knew each other for years. And then one day she came in with like this really cool looking Rasta guy. And she's like, this is my husband. And she's like, nobody knew I was married because I took off my ring and pretended I was single just because I didn't want to have to answer the questions or deal with the shame. And I was like, that's fucked up, man. That is so fucked up that these people have to suffer so much and they didn't do anything wrong. And even the fact that there's drug crimes is simply because the government criminalizes those drugs, simply because they need a way to arrest and target and hurt the communities that they need to keep down. So it's obviously a major issue. It goes way beyond uh, the freedom to get a license to sell weed. Like there's, we all know that there's so much at play here, but well, you know, the African American culture is actually two hundred thirty-six percent more likely to get arrested than, a, you know, a white man or woman. And, and, and where cannabis is legalized, um, we see that the, it doesn't just remain at those rates; it goes up. It's like it gives more ability to harass somehow. And yeah, to your point. Yeah, absolutely. You're also seeing what I'm calling cannabis colonialism. It's like. Okay, and first of all, I'm not, I don't want to wade into race issues. I really dislike it. I just like us all to get along. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Obviously, like a old white rich man thing. Okay, but that's happened. And unfortunately, with cannabis, what we've seen is that a lot of people who grew and nurtured this industry um, all around the world, like we're not just talking to. You're talking the origin of capitalism. Yes, and, so, and this, I mean, made problem. <laughs> cannabis got sucked into that system. And, but, you know, I, I just have this feeling, I have this weird feeling, like, you know how I became an activist because I finally consumed cannabis and then I started to question stuff? Like, I feel like this quiet revolution that's happening is that a lot of people are going to use cannabis for medicine because their friend uses it and it works, and they're going to change their mind and they're going to turn towards compassion. They will. And it's like this, this quiet revolution. So it's like, we need more people growing cannabis, using it, talking about it, tearing down the stigma. And the government is always behind the people in terms of changing laws to match popular opinion. But if you look around right now, if popular opinion is this overwhelming, and you look at the fact that things like the Moore Act, like there's things that are happening in America and around the world that are just like shaking things up so much. And I can't help but feel that no matter what, cannabis is like, weed that it is you know you can pave it over with concrete but it still breaks through well i mean this is something that was used in spiritual rituals over you know 400 years ago uh you know they found in in israel actually and when you look at the lineage and the the time that it was used i mean this is something that we've been using forever i mean you see it in inscribed in, you know in egyptian hieroglyphics um and so it's like what is this secret that we don't know about right and and is there something that we don't know that the government knows and or are they just so scared that cannabis is going to become this like uh, it's going to overthrow the government because it's going to produce so much money for the middle class right that it's essentially going to give them the ability to become um certainly more wealthy than some of the uh current capitalists you're hitting a nail on the head i think cannabis offers is liberation it's the liberation of your health liberation of your spirit economic liberation if you can have a business and it's just something that's empowering to people and the old systems are changing and failing and cannabis exposes that this goes right back to jack Herrera's book the emperor wears no clothes why because cannabis is the thing that points it out and says that is bullshit and it's a lie and it's not true and you're all being fooled and now it's time to wake up and that's what cannabis is doing it's the tree of life it really is and i get to this cannabis evangelist side but um cannabis has saved my life cannabis has saved many lives around me cannabis kills cancer cells cannabis prevents mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. cannabis does all these things that sound so crazy cannabis protects lungs it gives people purpose
are we are built with an endocannabinoid system because we are meant to be with this plant and it's it's i just look at my harvest that's drying over there man the feeling i get and when i smoke the first joint they're your babies you know it it's you it's your energy and what cannabis demonstrates to you mm-hmm. is like when you put your love and energy to your plants your food your family your work your community your world positive vibes give you positive feedback no question. It's bad. And right now, holy moly, the world needs some serious positive vibes. So my mission is, if people want to stay tuned, I'll be launching stores, growing. I might do a thing called Jody Grows. Um, I've got a lot of ideas, and it all goes back to um, making sure that as we all celebrate success in business, because we all damn deserve it. Um, no shit. We all deserve to be secure and successful if we put in the hard work for it. But, um, you know, beyond that, it's like I just see a spiritual awakening that's happening. And I think cannabis is going to help people just return to a, an individualized, personalized, but, you know, where you're still connected to everything else. It's like you become stronger mm-hmm. yourself through your connection to others. And cannabis offers that peace, the tolerance, the understanding. It's a, it's a miracle plant. And I went from being anti-weed to doing all this stuff. So, you know, it must be powerful. <laughs> yeah. If, if Hey, you know, uh, this one time, and I'm totally guilty of this, this one time I was uh, trying to steal change from my dad's little bedside drawer. I was a kid, you know, I was young. I was you know, in middle school or something like that. And uh, maybe, maybe sophomore high school. And I found a bag of weed in his side drawer and I was so mad. Oh, I was so mad. I was like, oh my God. And I poured it all out. And he was so mad at me after he found out. Um, cause he's like, where's my weed at? And he saw little granulars in the garbage can and he flipped shit. Um, you know, he's like, that could get me arrested. I'm like, oh shit. I, you know, I don't know. But, um, but now I'm like, you know, a cannabis like enthusiast. I've got it tattooed, you know, pot leaves on my arms and shit. So it's, you know, I live and breathe this literally too. And that just, it, that's what's also sad is all the families that have broken apart and literally disowning their own children over cannabis. And it's like these yeah. these harms have been going on for far too long. So we need to change laws and regulations and stigma and the perception. And that requires three different things. It requires political engagement, educating people, and a little bit of civil disobedience to show people how it's done. <laughs> so let me so so let me ask you this question because uh, you just stemmed into something that I wanted to expand on uh, as you were talking earlier about um, uh, cannabis lounges, right? And in Washington State, as you know, you can't smoke. There's no cannabis lounge law. Uh, you can't have like, there's no consumption environments. So what's interesting is you can't legally smoke outside. And if you live in an apartment building, you can't smoke in your apartment. Um, so where the hell do you smoke weed? Now I've practiced thus far the civil disobedience part because I pretty much told my building, I said, so basically what you're telling me is to, is to commit an illegal act. You are telling me that, uh, cannab- I can, I can legally buy cannabis. I can bring it into my apartment, but I can't smoke my medicine inside my unit. You're telling me that I have to go commit an illegal act. I'm not going to do that. This is my home. It's amazing. This is one of the top issues because people are getting evicted. One of the worst stories in Canada, get this, the disabled man in a wheelchair used marijuana, vaporized and smoked. He was told he can't do it or he's being evicted. He had to use it in a wheelchair. He's sick. He used it. He got evicted and he was sleeping in the forest under a garbage bag when the cannabis activist community rallied some money and they got attention for him. Like that's what these laws are doing. They're Holy shit. People under garbage bags in fucking woods in the rain. And that's what the news article was all about. It's like, how can this be happening when it's supposed to be legal? So it, the housing issue is a major problem here because we have the same thing. You get a ticket or fine if you smoke outside and you get evicted if you smoke indoors. So there's no legal place to smoke it. And that's being challenged with a lot of laws. A weird thing in British Columbia is that, well, they have all the Clean Air Act, so smoking anything is prohibited. So I want to argue... First of all, there's a lot of science to show smoke from cannabis isn't harmful. Smoke from a lot of other things is harmful. And then two, you could use an Amsterdam model from the coffee shops. A lot of them had a glass barrier and the smokers are in one room and the employees are safely in a clean smoke zone. We could go with that approach if smoke in the workplace is dangerous, is the argument. And then you can also 
um, just share the fact that a lot of things are dangerous. When you go to a gym, you have to sign a waiver. When you go skiing, you might hurt yourself. If you work in construction, you might get injured. The world is full of risks. And if people want to voluntarily submit themselves to cannabis smoke and they sign a waiver saying, I hereby love smoking weed and want to be in it, <laughs> then you can like go ahead and do it. So I want to like present these options to government. Like, here are your avenues. The science says it's not harmful. Can we start with Washington first, please? You can, you can do it best because like, I don't know how exactly they ban it, but in BC up here, they've managed to prohibit lounges through banning the promote. You're not allowed in Canada to tell people where to go to smoke weed, and you're not allowed to tell them, come here after you smoke weed. So it's like if you're an orchestra, I'm like, they wanted to say like get high and come experience the sounds they're not allowed to say that so there's this like section 36 or 37 that we need to get rid of but our argument is this um lawyers are amazing i love lawyers we have great lawyers who've been fighting the cause the good lawyers are the defenders of liberty and, and we need them um and what they've come up with is in canada under the charter we have freedom of association uh, and that was born out of union groups like wanting to organize a union so if you work for a place and you're like, we deserve rights. You can't be told you're not allowed to gather and talk about how to get rights. Like you have to be allowed to gather with like-minded people, freedom of assembly, or freedom of association rather, not assembly, freedom of association. Mm -hmm. So that's a charter right that's protected. And we want to argue that the, the ban on lifestyle promotion, the ban on promoting cannabis as medicine, the ban on letting people know where to smoke weed and to come and use it in a safe space, those mm -hmm. that's all a violation of charter rights so we're going to challenge that that's one of my many projects but another argument that you can say is um you know the fact that they the, the punishment for for smoking weed is more harmful than smoking weed itself so you could argue to governments that you know when you actually punish people you're causing more harm than what you claim to protect them against um you could also there's another argument you could use well, well, that we're fueling the prison system by incarcerating people for cannabis crimes in the first place, uh, because they're all private. Most of them are privately owned, anyways. We need to come together. We need to be able to connect with one another, and so the ability to gather as a cannabis enthusiast, like they, if you like yoga, you got yoga places. If you like coffee, craft beer. If you like anything, you can find your people and you can hang out. Cannabis consumers are still told that we're dirty, awful, sinful, shameful people that can't come together because goodness knows we're just all dangerous people harming our health or whatever they want to say. Right. So it's like we really need to upend that stigma. And I think what's happening right now with the opioid crisis, at least here, there's a lot of rapid drug policy reform going on with respect to safe supply, um, supervised injection sites, like a lot of harm reduction measures. So I'm trying to make sure cannabis gets pulled into that because all the evidence Smart. Cannabis reduces opioid deaths by up to 33%. We could really use that here where we are dying every minute. And so it's, it's something we can push as like a harm reduction approach. Like that's another argument. Well, I think an argument though that they could make is, and this is just playing devil's advocate as it relates to the science behind cannabis. But, um, you know, when you de decarboxylate cannabis, you never really get, uh, you know, 100% of the plant's original profile. Um, because of that decarboxylation process. So, you know, there are technologies that do exist, like um, Harvest Direct's Lacey technology that can extract the plant's original profile and, and put it into a capsule, right? And, and there, you know, a physician can actually make a recommendation as it relates to cannabis strain specificity because the, um, the, the, the profile will always be consistent. And that's the biggest issue is lack of consistency. Seeking should totally be a part that and i think what we really need to make available is the education for using it like i said educate about regular sustained use and like tolerance and all those things like that's specific medicine and but when we look at these lounges the idea of having a space where people can consume whether it's medical or recreational i think a really good argument is that it's kind of it's kind of like how we said, oh, we need to legalize retail stores because otherwise people go to the shady alleyway deal. You know, you have to kind of like make it look like if it's not above board, it's going to be dark and shady. So you could kind of argue with lounges. It's like people are accessing legal cannabis for the first time ever. And here in Canada, if you go into the store and you buy weed, 
They're not allowed to tell you how to use it. They're not allowed to tell you that it's medicine. They can't tell you anything. You have to walk away ignorant, except for the government warning label, which is false. Which is also ignorant. They walk away with this product and they go home and maybe they get way too high and it's a terrible experience. Whose fault is that? It's the government's fault for not allowing that person to walk next door to a lounge and be like, tell me, expert lounge person, how do I use this safely? And then if they green out, you have a policy in place. Like my lounge, Cannabis Culture Lounge, we've been doing this for years, it's 16 years. And it's like you come in and you have somebody who knows everything about cannabis. They recognize signs of people needing assistance. Can't you just make it a private club and just say, hey, look, this is an education center, um, private memberships. Um, that's a good way to put it. That's what one of the labs in Toronto is doing. They're actually saying, we're doing reporting. We're actually studying cannabis users because they self-report for use here. So there's all sorts of ways to do it. And like usual, it's, it takes a little bit of not trickery or loopholes, but just um, bending the rules. You know, like a good way to put it. Word, word play. It's like a good way of just being able to, yeah, just like, you got to set the example, right? Like, again, government catches yep. up to what people are doing. So decide how much risk you want to take. Some people, they can't. It's good advice. They can't even risk, you know, putting their name to the letter about weed in the newspaper. That's too risky for them. They've got a job they might lose. So choose your risk profile level and go with it with your activism. Um, if you want to be like me and open up a bunch of illegal stores and say, this is how it should be done, it comes with consequences, but it also makes an impact. So, so we're... Where can people find you, Jody? I am found online a lot uh, at cannabisculture.com is our main website for our company. Uh, but me personally, I use Twitter a lot. I tweet a lot of science and information. That's twitter.com slash Jody Emery, J-O-D-I-E-E-M-E-R-Y, like Jody, like Jody Foster. <laughs> Not many people might remember. Contact, that was such a great movie. Um, <laughs> so Jody, I loved it. Jody Emery. At uh, Instagram as well, same thing, Instagram at Jody Emery, and also Perfect. Facebook. Um, I don't respond to Facebook messages. I just can't keep on top of all the, all the messages on all the, pro, all the platforms and stuff. So, But I am on there. I post things, and people can engage and share there. Cool. And that's pretty much it. I'm hoping to launch, like everybody in the world, a podcast soon called Jody's Joint, where I interview activists and find out how they started their activism and what they also care about, what they do aside from cannabis now that we have other, um, you know, we're making gains in this area. So what else do you want to work on? For some, it's the environment. For some, it's animal rights. Um, for some, it's just like... Psilocybin. Exactly. There's so many things going yeah. on out there. It's very exciting. And I think we just need to lift each other up and, you know, and look past our differences. This is a time of... Um, a lot of hurt feelings and it's really interesting because i was in such a dark bitter pained mm -hmm. three years and then i started emerging only to see the rest of the world kind of going downhill and i'm like no don't go down to the dark don't give in don't let evil win give into goodness and give into compassion and just close your eyes and pretend that you're blind and all you have around you is your fellow human beings and how to survive and get through this and just Fucking hold the hands of the people you love too. Another thing is a lot of people are dying that I know, not from COVID, but from a lot of random stuff. And it's just reminding me that like life is precious and you do not want your last interaction with someone to be a negative one. So get over the fucking differences in fighting. Find something common and beautiful to share. Um, I swear it'll help. And grow weed, take microdose psilocybin and uh, <laughs> get a lot of sunshine if you can. And that's my... My, <laughs> my my mom always said, you know, how do you want to be remembered when you die? And that never that never left me because, you know, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's a really good question. You know, I, and I had such an ego at the time when she asked me that. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm going to conquer the world with weed. Um, and uh, and, you know, I've I've put my ego in check, obviously, but I'm still on a mission to, you know, rebrand cannabis. Uh, one brand at a time on a global level. So ego, by the way, we all need a little bit of ego because it, as long as it's kept in check, um, it, mm -hmm. it drives us. But also, what you just said, like, how do you want to be remembered when you die? Well, what is that? That's your personal brand. How did you make people feel? Make sure you left them feeling good, right? <laughs> yep. Well, you know, and I always say, and, you know, I always say, uh, you know, the brand, a brand is the promise that you make to your customer. So it's, it's, it's so true what you just said. Um,
But look, Jody, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, you have been awesome and you shared some serious knowledge and it was seriously awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I've read so much about you online and obviously we've met a few times at conferences that we've been speaking at. But, you know, I, I'm really glad that I got to learn things that I haven't read about. And that to me was what was most important about this conversation is, is really understanding the depth of Jody and, and how you've become um, this just amazing, uh, you know, cannabis activist, politician, journalist, woman. I mean, you're incredible. So thank you so much. A lot of newcomers to cannabis only saw sad jody i want to make sure i'm rebranding myself as no 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 i'm not scary and mad i'm not going to yell at you for being a hypocrite i'm going to welcome you for changing sides <laughs> yeah and and if you don't agree with me i'm going to educate you until you do and i will also question what i think i know because i'm not the all-knowing and we all can open ourselves up to improving our knowledge base and being aware that Maybe we're wrong sometimes, but sometimes when it comes to cannabis, I'm pretty darn sure we're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> follow your gut, follow your instinct. Jody, thank you so much. Uh, again, I appreciate you. You're um, an inspiration to us all. And um, uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. We'll have to find some other country. Jamaica? I know. Yeah, we might have to. Shit. <laughs> Very not. Colombia? I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. Bye. <laughs>